a young woman came running out of a burning house, screaming, my baby, my baby, someone get my baby. A group of firemen had just arrived, so one of them soaked himself down, ran into the house, threw the smoke and flames, made it upstairs to the baby's room, and quickly grabbed the infant. He wrapped it in a wet blanket, and he raced back down and out of the house. But it is impossible to describe the horror on the mother's face when she unwrapped that blanket to find the baby's doll instead. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. There have always been false paths and false leaders leading people down them. And that's what we see in our text this morning. We are continuing through this letter of Jude. It's brief. So far, we have seen our security in Christ for those who are genuine believers in verses 1 and 2. We also saw the main theme of this letter, and we looked at that last time. Jude's original intention was to write about salvation, but there was a shift in his focus to an admonition for true believers to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And as I said last week, verse 3 is the key to the entire epistle. This is a serious call to arms. It is a battle cry for the fight over the purity of the Christian faith. And this is really something that is critical for our day and time. You see, we can't assume that the Christian faith is going to remain pure and undefiled. We can't assume that it won't get twisted and distorted. And there are many false prophets and many false teachers in our day and time, even apostates, who have attacked the sound doctrine of biblical theology. The most serious attacks against the truth come not from outside the church, but from within the church. It comes from those who claim to love the truth and believe it. And those, of course, are the most subtle kind of attacks and therefore the most dangerous. So we have to fight to keep the gospel pure. And this is really a never-ending battle in the church. You say, why do we need to be so diligent to earnestly contend for the faith that is once for all delivered to the saints? Well, look with me at verse 4. Jude says, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reason why we need to be diligent. There are those who have crept into the church unnoticed, and they have evil intentions in regard to perverting the truth. So it is at times very difficult for us to be able to defend the truth and guard the truth because many who come in who are false teachers are those who claim to love the Word of God. And so it takes a great deal of discernment and fortitude and courage to do what Jude is commanding us to do. And folks, I personally do not believe 
that the contemporary church of today is very good at contending earnestly for the faith. I don't think we do this very well. But we have this mandate. We have this mandate from God. Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy 6.20. He said, guard what has been entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 1.14, he wrote, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that has been entrusted. So what is that treasure? Well, in the previous verse, he tells us, he says, retain the standard of sound words which you heard from me. This is the apostolic teaching that we see recorded for us in the New Testament. He goes on in the next chapter and he says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We, we need to pass the unadulterated truth on down to the next generation. And this is the treasure that we have been entrusted with. And this is what we must be able then to pass on down and pass on to the next generation with biblical integrity and without perversion. You might call this a truth trust. It is a high responsibility. We have been given this truth trust. It has been entrusted to us. And so we need to make sure we guard it and so this morning, I want us to look at the subject of identifying phony faith. We're going to see five characteristics here in verse 4 of those who exemplify phony faith. Five characteristics. The first thing we see is their deceitfulness. Their deceitfulness. They crept in unnoticed. And the idea here is that of sneaking in with evil intent. In 2 Peter 2, the apostle Peter describes the same thing, but he words it a little differently. He says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, listen to this, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destru destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. The truth is going to be uh, perverted. And Peter really is saying the same thing. He's pointing to the same danger here. They're going to be false prophets. They're going to be false teachers. They're going to introduce secretly destructive heresies, and you're not even going to know what happens. But it's going to do its damage. And false prophets are sneaking into the fellowship of believers all over the world. They're coming in unnoticed. They have evil intent. They want to secretly introduce destructive heresies that will lead believers astray. Now, the Greek word here that we find in this phrase is uh, pere is the duo. It means to settle in alongside. The idea is like that of a squatter that comes into a village and begins living among the people. And the point is, they have moved into the fellowship of the true believers. They've come into the church. In verse 12, we're told, these men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. And the love feast was that, which was a meal that at the very early days of the church was served kind of before the Lord's Supper, and so they would have this meal together, and they would partially, uh, part of the reason for it is they would feed the poor, and then they would have the Lord's Supper together. And we're told these men are like hidden reefs in your love feasts. 
This tells us that the apostates were right there in the midst of the other saints. They were observing the ordinances with them. They're on the inside. And by the way, that's the only place where they can do any damage. I mean, it wouldn't really do a whole lot of good for a false teacher to go to some deserted islands. They wouldn't have an audience. They have to be among the flock. They have to be in the midst of the saints. And in order to do this, they have to pretend to be sheep. The word that is used literally means to slip in by the side, to slip in by the side. They come in the side door. They adopt the vocabulary of the saints. They come in talking about God. They look like true believers, but they're not. They're false. They're apostates, many of them. By the way, it's impossible to keep them out. You can't keep them out of the church. Even the apostles could not keep them out of the early church. Uh, the Bible tells us there are always going to be tares among the wheat. It's very difficult to know the difference. There are always going to be those who profess to know Christ but do not possess genuine saving faith. But these false teachers come in looking like Christians and acting like Christians and claiming to love the Lord. They talk a good talk. They do all the right things. But eventually it becomes clear they are not true believers at all. This is why we have to be discerning in regard to the truth. This is why. This is why we must be committed to earnestly contending for the true faith because those with phony faith are going to come in and they're eventually going to work their way into positions of leadership and influence and the next thing we know, they'll want to change our policies and then they'll want to change our philosophy of ministry and eventually they'll want to change our doctrine as well. They're going to come in, and their primary goal is to introduce destructive heresies. Folks, that is exactly what has happened in countless liberal mainline churches across our country. That is exactly what has taken place in many Christian schools that were once committed to the truth and committed to the propagation of the gospel, but now are virtually secular institutions. Listen, the original, the very first president of Princeton said, as soon as he took office, he said, quote, Cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ, end quote. And listen, he would surely be ashamed of what has happened to that university today. This happens in whole denominations. Entire denominations have fallen prey to this kind of insidious deception. And listen, don't think ours won't. We're just as susceptible as any other. And listen, folks, I'm, I'm grateful that Southern Baptists did not go the way of other denominations. But back in the late 1970s, they took back control of the convention from the liberals and they stood strong on a commitment to the inerrancy of Scripture, and I am grateful for that. But on the other hand, we have allowed a lot of mysticism and a lot of charismatic theology to move into our ranks. We have embraced an unbiblical form of church polity. We have allowed people to become prominent teachers in our denomination that are not committed to a literal, historical, grammatical interpretation of Scripture. And I won't get started on this because I could go on and on. But we need to be discerning as well. All of us. 
These people with phony faith are so deceitful and so deceptive because they're just subtle and they creep in unnoticed. We, we don't even know what happens. And all of a sudden we're dealing with this stuff. The church receives them with open arms the day they join the church, but they're like that Trojan horse that was welcomed as a great trophy, but eventually destroyed a mighty people. They bring in destruction. And folks, we need to realize that any movement today that seems to be being blessed of God needs to be watched very carefully, very carefully, because Satan is the ultimate deceiver and he is going to do everything he possibly can to get his people on the inside to wreak havoc to the truth. You know, we read in Scripture that Satan's ministers appear as angels of light. They're so deceptive. In fact, turn with me for a moment to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul was also addressing the issue of false teachers. Look with me at verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. Satan's henchmen do not come in parading themselves as devils. No, they come in parading themselves as angels of light. They come in looking like saints, looking like sheep. They come in and they dwell right alongside with the true believers. They talk the talk. They sing in the choir. They disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. But all along, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, Jesus also warned of this same danger. So turn with me for a moment to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, and look with me for a moment at verse 15. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. He says they're going to come in and they're going to look like sheep. You won't be able to tell them apart. They will be wearing sheep's clothing. But on the inside... They're wolves that desire to consume the flock. And then he goes on to say, you will know them by their fruits. You'll, you'll find out who they really are. E eventually, it will become clear from their immorality that they're not truly sheep. Now, Paul warned of the same thing in Acts chapter 20. So one more Turn with me to Acts 20. And you may know that Acts 20 records the conversation between Paul and the Ephesian elders. But look with me at Acts 20 and verse 28. Paul says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, talking to the elders here, to shepherd the church of God, which is purchased with his own blood. Why is this so important that the elders are on guard for themselves and for all the flock? Well, verse 29 says, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
and from among your own selves, out of your own congregation, men are going to arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. All of these New Testament writers are saying the same thing. But, but going back to Jude and what Jude says, Jude does not specifically identify these false teachers. He simply says certain persons. We don't really know who these people are. We don't really know the full extent of their heresy, but I believe that is intentional on the part of the Holy Spirit who inspired this letter because really there are false teachers in every generation. We have false teachers in our time. And whoever they are and whatever their perversion of the truth, they are all equally dangerous. So this applies to us as well. This is very relevant for our day. And the false teachers come in and they work their way into positions of influence and they ultimately begin to change the doctrines of the church. In Jude's day, the greatest danger was what was known as Gnosticism. We've talked about that. We saw that clearly in 1 John. And some had come in and they had very subtly began to so lies about the nature and person of Jesus Christ. But there have been various attacks on the truth since the earliest days of the church. These attacks are predicted by Christ himself, by Paul, Peter, John, and now Jude. And listen, these attacks are going to continue until the day that Christ returns. So we can never let up. We must constantly guard the truth. But Jude here employs three terms to describe these apostates. He says they are ungodly, they are perverters of grace, and they are deniers of Christ. Look at it again in Jude 4, last part of the verse. He says, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to say kind of the same thing a little bit later on in verse 11. So look at verse 11. He says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Cain illustrates the ungodliness of apostasy, Balaam pictures the perversion of grace into the sin of licentiousness. And Korah demonstrates rebellion against God's appointed leader, which really becomes a type of one who would ultimately reject the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that in more detail when we get to verse 11. But we see very clearly here that the first characteristic of these false teachers is their deceitfulness. They creep in unnoticed. A second characteristic is their devotion. Their devotion, and I'm using that term in a kind of a specialized way. Jude says they are ungodly men. The word literally means lack of reverence for God. They don't fear God. The word is Asebus. In verse 15, he's going to use it in four different forms. It's like he's just piling this term one on top of another. This ungodliness is not usually seen outwardly, it's usually seen inwardly. On the outside, they appear to have a love for and a devotion for God. They sing the songs, they pray the prayers, they do all the things that are expected of them to look like genuine believers. But inwardly, they have hearts of rebellion and unbelief. Paul talked about those who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. 
And these that Jude is speaking of are those who make a claim of godliness, but they are in fact, God declares, ungodly. They're ungodly. By the way, they may be preachers or teachers in the church and still be ungodly. Listen, just because a man is an interesting Bible teacher doesn't mean he's a godly man. You need to look at his life and see if it backs up what he's teaching. Just because someone is popular and well-liked doesn't necessarily mean they're godly. Just because they're successful in business and generous with their giving doesn't necessarily mean they're godly. In fact, I, the devotion of the apostate is really summarized in Paul's words to Titus in Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Well, there's a third characteristic and that is their demeanor, their demeanor. Jude says they are those who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness. <coughs> the word for licentiousness means unrestrained vice. Eight out, of time, eight out of ten times this word is used in Scripture. It refers to sensuality. It literally has to do with someone who doesn't care who sees their immorality. They just flaunt it. This is someone who says, hey, I'm under grace. I can do what I want. And they cry, grace, grace, grace. But listen, Paul warned in Galatians 5.13, for you are called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This is exactly what Jude is saying. Don't turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Of course, the word licentious is connected with the word license. So Paul is saying, don't let your freedom in Christ turn into a license to sin. That's not what the grace of God is about. But these apostates don't care about that. They're perverting the doctrine of grace into a justification for sin. It's the same kind of philosophy that in our day and time leads to churches for homosexuals. It is true of those who promote prom promiscuity or sensuality in any form in the church. And people like this are in seminaries and they're, they're in Christian colleges all over the place. They're the theological liberals who deny the truths of Scripture. They're the clerics who end up molesting children in the church. And these phonies are really enemies of God's grace. Jude says they're turning the grace of God into licentiousness. You see, they want the church to be filled with immorality because then that will make them feel better about their own sin. But listen, grace was never intended by God to become a license for sin. In fact, turning again to what Paul said to Titus in Titus 2, 11 through 13, we read, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire, desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul says grace should result in the exact opposite of ungodliness. It should result in a godly life. It should lead to godliness. Of course, the problem is that those who are not truly 
born again do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in them. Those who have never been truly spiritually regenerated have no real power to overcome the flesh and moral willpower alone won't get it done. It is only the power of the Holy Spirit that is the result of spiritual regeneration that provides the power to overcome sin in a person's life. And this is why we really should not be at all surprised that apostates commit grave sins. So we see their deceitfulness, their devotion, their demeanor. And fourthly, we see their denial, their denial. Jude says they deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, this may not mean that they necessarily deny him with their lips, but usually with their lives. They may say all the right things about Christ, but they deny him by how they live. They will not live under the sovereign lordship of Christ. And as a result, they also may, to justify this, twist and distort what the Bible teaches concerning the person and work of Christ. This may lead to false doctrine, and it may lead to a distortion of the true, true gospel. Titus 1.16 says, They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. They deny him. They deny him. But Jude goes on to explain what he means by this. Essentially, this short phrase that is at the last part of verse 4 tells us that there are four things about the person and work of Christ that they deny. First of all, they deny his rule. The word for master there is the word despotes, which uh, is where we get our English word despot. You know what that means. Is one who is an absolute monarch. It is one who has absolute sovereignty. And sometimes false teachers deny the sovereignty of Christ. Now that might be through some for, form of hyper-Arminianism, such as open theism. It might be through some form of universalism. But anything that negates the absolute sovereign rule of Christ is a denial of his divine person. They deny Christ. The apostates were doing this in the days of the early church. Secondly, they deny his lordship. This is similar to the first one, but it's kind of on a more personal level. Of course, the word for Lord there is kurios. It can mean master as well. And there are a number of ways that false teachers may deny the lordship of Christ. It might be the old idea of, hey, just accept Jesus as your Savior and you can always receive him as Lord later. Or it might be some form of bringing Jesus down to the level of being merely your best friend or treating Jesus as if he were a mere man. Whatever the form, we must always make sure that we are worshiping Jesus Christ as Master and Lord. We need to bow our knee in submission to him. Paul said in Philippians 2, Therefore also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen, when you receive Jesus, you receive him as who he is. And he is both Savior and Lord. Yes, he's Savior, but he's also Lord and he's also King. So when you receive him, you receive him as who he is really is. Thirdly, they deny his saviorhood. The name Jesus points to the fact that he 
came to be our Savior. That's what the name Jesus literally means. It says in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that, w- that which was lost. In Matthew 1, 21, we read where the angel told Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. He came as the one and only Savior of the worlds. But listen, the apostates deny that he is the Savior. They may do this by teaching that he was simply a human teacher and a good man, but not fully God. They may teach that he was a martyr, that his plans went horribly awry, and that he did not expect to be crucified. They may teach that he was merely a prophet or a moral teacher, but not the Savior. However they may do it, anyone who takes away from the fact that Jesus Christ is the one and only Savior sent by God, is a false teacher and must be rejected. Fourthly, they deny his Messiahship. The word for Christ there means anointed one. In Scripture, it always points to the Messiah. And although it is most common among Jews, anyone who denies that Jesus is the Messiah of God is denying a very major important truth in Scripture. We know that hundreds of prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus, and no one can deny that he is the one whom God sent to fulfill his divine purpose for redemption. He is God's Messiah. So we see their denial, but lastly, we see their doom. We see their doom. Jude says, they are those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Folks, that is a very interesting statement. Even before Jude identifies these apostates, he declares that their ultimate destruction is predicted. You could even say decreed. The Greek word is pale pro grapho, which means written ages ago. It's a perfect participle, which means this is something that happened in the past and still has continuing results in the present. And what this phrase means is that these persons were foreordained by God for judgment. Wow. That almost sounds like double-edged predestination, doesn't it? Listen to what the apostle Peter said of them in 2 Peter 2.3. In fact, if you want to very quickly turn with me, we'll finish with this. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. Peter says, And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter, verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and he also knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgments. Listen, the point is, If God knows how to punish those who turned away from the truth in former times, he certainly knows how to judge those who are apostates 
in our day and time, really any time in history. So we end this morning with a warning of judgment for those who fall away from the truth. In Jeremiah 531, the prophet asks a very interesting question. He says, the prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule in their own authority and my people love it so, but what will you do at the end of it all? What will you do at the end of it? In other words, what will you do when the ultimate judgment of God comes? What will you do then? And the question for us this morning is, what do we need to do with this strong warning? If we are wise, we will heed it. We will make sure we are firmly committed to biblical truth. We will make sure we are in the truth, that we are truly born again, children of God. We'll make sure that we're not being deceived by anything that is false, but we're firmly committed to the truth that God has given to us. May we be people like that. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning you'll help us to understand the significance of this text. Lord, I pray if there are any here today that do not have assurance of salvation, that they would come and just nail that down this morning and know you and, and experience your saving grace. And Lord, for all of us who belong to you, we pray you would help us to understand how critical it is for us to guard your truth. Help us to earnestly contend for it because there are always those who are coming in unnoticed, sowing destructive heresies and distorting your truth. Help us to be people that are fully committed to you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, we'll give you that opportunity to respond to the Lord. This morning, we'll have some elders here near the front. If you need to receive Christ today, come talk to one of these men. They'll help you. If you need to do something, maybe like what you saw this morning with uh, Michael, and take that next step, an act of obedience, and follow the Lord in believer's baptism. You need to do that. Maybe you need to be a part of this church body and officially unite with us. Um, maybe you want to just say, you know, I haven't really been committed to guarding God's truth, and I, I need to be in there earnestly contending. And uh, maybe you would say, you know, Lord, help me with that. You want to just recommit yourself to that responsibility today. Whatever it is that uh, you need to do in response, um, our prayers that you would do that this morning. Well, as I mentioned, uh, we will be here tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, I'm going to be dealing with something that I think you're going to find very interesting, okay? So tape the game and come here, and uh, I'm going to talk about the danger of private revelation tonight. So come and be part of that. Well, it's great to have all of you with us today, especially our guests. If you're visiting today, hope you feel welcome with us, that you'll come back and be with us again. Let's stand together.